in Uganda. During the meeting held at the State House Investors Protection Unit offices in Kampala today, the unit head, Colonel Edith Nakalema, noted that there was a gap in having a clear investment policy after receiving a lot of concern from the business community and government agencies. Kano Nakalema said as stakeholders, they need to streamline the country's investment environment by setting up favorable policies. She decried the inefficiency of the Small Business Recovery Fund and the Agricultural Credit Facility programs, which are meant to revive and support businesses of Ugandans. Mr. Francis Gimara, the head of the A ALP Advocates, said he was happy with the work with Shipu to support many businesses in Uganda. ALP Advocates is an East African regional law firm that embodies the best qualities of the region, cooperation, hard work and progress. The Director, Economics Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Mr. Moses Kagwa, said the government is focused on how to promote investments in the country and it has put in place several avenues to achieve the goal. On the issue of licensing investors, Mr. Kagwa advised that this should be done in clusters. The Director in Charge of Supervision, Bank of Uganda, Dr. Dr. Twimuwine, Twinamazima said, as stakeholders should look at the minimum requirements for investment licensing, they should ensure they put incentives in place to attract investors. He advised that incentives such as tax holidays should be given to investors who really need them in order to serve the right purpose. Uganda Revenue Authority has asked Parliament to reinstate the budget cut of 55.73 billion shillings on wages, which is bigger than the gap of their current staff on payroll. While presenting their financial policy statement of the year 2024-2025, where URA's budget estimate is at 564 billion shillings, the Commissioner General, URA, also asked Parliament to approve their structure of 169 billion shillings to help improve efficiency and tax collection. Officials from Uganda Revenue Authority, led by the State Minister for Finance in charge of general duties, Henry Musasizi, and the Commissioner General, URA, John Rojochi, Musinguzi have appeared before the Finance Committee of Parliament to present their financial policy statement for financial year 2024-2025. URA's budget estimate for 2024-2025 is 564.26 billion shillings, lower than the budget of 2023-2024, which was 619.99 billion shillings. State Minister for General Duties Henry Musa says URA suffered a budget cut of 55.73 billion shillings because of the annual utilized wage for the last two previous financial years. A big number of members of parliament who sit on this committee have disagreed with budget cut, saying they need to see efficiency in revenue collection and propose that the budget cut on wage is reinstated. If it is maintained, even this gap will not, the gap that will be created will not cover the current staff on, uh, on, 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 the, on, on, on the payroll. You should do. You should be very careful, not to cut even what they have. Something else, like you know, but not human resource that should be the ones to help us enhance the efficiency and collect for us more money. We ask the government and parliament to reinstate the the value for staff costs up to a tune equivalent to the existing contracts. And this is your proposal. So my question is actually, why would you bring us a proposal that is not tiring of what we want from URA? Okay? They want manpower. The projected revenue collection for 2024-2025 is estimated to be 31.5 trillion shillings, an increase of 1.9 trillion from the current year target of 29.7 trillion shillings, according to URA. As at 31st March 2024, they had collected 19.9 trillion shillings. Some members of parliament wanted to know the assumption of this increase in revenue collection. The target for 23-24 was 29.672. That's an increment of 
Now, when you apply the same increment of 15%, the target correction should be 34.12 trillion, not 31.54, which is being indicated. I'm wondering what is new and what is really magical that you are going to do to raise the expectation of this country that you are going to raise additional 1.9 trillion. I think that would put us at rest. New growth, let's say from 29.6 to now 31.5, representing revenue growth of about 6.4 percent, vis-a-vis the growth in the tax, um, the taxpayers' register. Minister Msasuzi told committee members that the higher performance in revenue is usually experienced in the last quarter of the financial year because there is more compliance. What URA has assured us, we have an assurance that by June 30th, we shall be able to meet our target of 29 trillion. We presented in Parliament the tax measures together with the administrative efficiency which we are seeking. Both of them, we expect to, them to generate 1.9 trillion. John Musinguzi explains the measures to be taken in achieving the target of 31.5 trillion revenue collection next financial year. Enforcement of some of the technologies. Some of these technologies, we've been rolling them out for the last three years, like IFRIS. But of late, we are reaching out to other wholesalers like the people in Chikubo. So when you hear some noise today uh, about, you know, uh, some taxpayers threatening to demonstrate over IFRIS, this is a good technology. You are a staff live because of greener pastures. Some who have stayed for a long time are pushed out because of enhanced terms and others like 80 so far failed to meet the integrity standards. Hence chest. I'm Navka Farida and Gloria Guitabinji in Kampala. The Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Thomas Tayewa, has tasked the Leader of Opposition to allow the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs, Balam Barugahara, a chance to pursue the release of political prisoners. Tayewa says the opposition wing should treat the move as a courtesy and provide the necessary support accordingly. Leader of Opposition Joel Senyonyi, who on Wednesday was hesitant, has finally tabled two lists, including alleged 18 missing persons and 55 political prisoners who are claimed to have been under detention for the last three years without trial. After officially taking the mantle as the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs, Balam Bargahara started the move to have the political prisoners released. For the young men who, who are detained and they have not yet gone on trial. So the President accepted it to pardon most of them who, are not, who don't have cases of murder. And he said security forces should, uh, and, and the intelligence should expedite the investigation uh, t uh, going on. So I will request my brother, uh, Honorable Joro Senyonyi, to give, right Honorable Joro Senyonyi, to give me the list. I will do that for you, Joel, and I will make sure the president uh, acts on that. The leader of opposition, Joel Senyonyi, embraced the avenue spearheaded by Minister Balam and has finally tabled the list of the alleged missing and political prisoners. We tabled those lists severally and so they are within the records. However, for there to be no excuse anymore, I would like to lay on table, uh, number one, the list of NUP supporters on remand in various courts, the likes of Olivia Lutaya and others who have been held for over three years, trial has not kicked off. Senyonyi tables the list with his body language describing a faint heart, basing on the history of the vain attempts to rescue the political prisoners. I'd like to also lay the list uh, of missing NUP supporters, which has John Bosco Chibalama and others, who, by the way, the Prime Minister told us was arrested and she knows where he is. But the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Speaker, Thomas uh, Tayewa, arrested the fears of the opposition, requesting Lop Senyonyi to accord the opportunity to Minister Balam to drive the campaign to free the political prisoners. Courtesy, okay? And uh, I urge you, honorable colleagues, you know, the best way to win an argument on this floor of parliament is by being courteous to each other. 
the, that way you win many hearts. You win, you know, the moment you do that, then we focus on the argument. Okay. In November last year, the Minister of State for Internal Affairs, David Mohozi, while responding to the demands of the opposition involving missing and alleged political prisoners, told the Parliament how government does not arrest people depending on their political inclinations. Minister Mohozi revealed to the House how the alleged prisoners were charged with respective offences and the courts will determine their fate. Additionally, Minister David Mohozi also said some alleged missing persons like John Bosco Chibarama were reported as un unwitnessed disappearances. And these include Kasumba George, uh, Kisembo Godfrey, and Kibarama John Bosco. Despite most of the alleged occurrences being reported to have taken in broad daylight, none of the alleged witnesses mentioned the registration number plates of the alleged vehicles involved. It has also been established that there is a well-orchestrated smear campaign of aiding people who seek to go abroad in search of livelihood opportunities to claim political persecution and or persecution for belonging to sexual minorities. They don't have any offence they have committed. If they committed any offence, surely three years down the road, you should have produced this evidence in court, but they have not produced any of this evidence in court. Daniel Mugoya, Gloria Gutabinji, UBC News. In a bid to enhance access to services, the Uganda Registration Service Bureau has launched an online business registration system. The permanent secretary of the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, Dr. Amina Zawede, commended URSB for the milestone achieved as well as emphasized the public to embrace such technological advancement. Previously, registering a business with URSB required cumbersome paperwork and prolonged waiting periods for certificates. However, with the launch of the online business registration system, the registration process is streamlined and automated significantly, reducing time and effort. And yeah. The Permanent Secretary Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, Dr. Amina Zawede, highlighted the collaboration between the Ministry and URSB in implementing the online registration system and its benefits. We, are, we have had already discussions of improving this system further. You know, we said we can't work in isolation. There are 25 MDAs that are already cross-checking information with this system. But there are also other systems that need to be automated. For example, when you're registering a business, you have to have a postal address. And that postal address resides with post office, for example. So we want to create ease of doing business, like the board chair said. Despite the benefits of digitalization, concerns about potential job losses due to automation persist. Before, when people were doing a registration of their businesses, they would come in and maybe you have a copy typist entering data and all this, but today people are doing it themselves using either a phone or a computer or a laptop. So we don't need a copy typist in a room somewhere to be feed, you know, entering this data. Masika Inewesho, the Registrar General of URSB, revealed that the agency aims to register over 873,543 unregistered businesses by the end of the fiscal year 2026-2027. The core functions are to register all those over 30 registers that we have. We also maintain the registers and we collect non-tax revenue as we register as well. And uh, we have registered uh, a lot of progress in terms of business registration. There's an increase in company registrations by over 35%. There's an increase of marriage registrations by over 40%. There's an increase of utility model registrations. These are like um, simple innovations that solve community problems. The increase is even by 100%. This shift to online registration has minimized corruption risks and increased fairness in application process. One step, two step, three, up to like how many steps, seven steps, but now there are very few steps that uh, you go through to register your business. So it has addressed the cost of doing business, the cost of registration, the time it takes to register, 
and uh, the, the inconveniences that come with registration. This launched online registration service that was rolled a year back has since collected 90 billion Ugandan shillings for government. Justin Nakami, UBC News. Devoted coffee farmers and nursery bed operators have threatened to cut down all the coffee trees that they supply to different farmers on credit. If the government doesn't pay their areas amounting to 49 billion shillings, while declaring a seven-day demonstration, a group of coffee seedling farmers under their umbrella of devoted coffee farmers and nursery bed operators say if their areas are not paid in a week's time, they will retaliate by clearing coffee gardens across the country. We are not happy when we move around, you see farmers who picked coffee seedlings from you, they are doing better than you giving them the seedlings. Of course, we feel like destroying the coffee they have planted. Under their umbrella of devoted coffee farmers and nursery bed operators, the desperate coffee farmers have threatened to take the last option to demand for their long overdue arrears for coffee seedlings supplies, the arrears amounting to 49 billion shillings, according to them, accumulated over a period of time since 2015. But our concern is we had payments which were from 2017 to 2021 which were already sanctioned by Parliament. We want to see our disappointment that up to now we have not been paid. Now three financial years have passed since Parliament appropriated money. In a letter dated 2nd April 2024 is a notification served and received by police over their intention to carry on a week-long peaceful demonstration over their unpaid coffee arrears. We are going to start with the Uganda Parliament. Uh, we are going to Minister of Finance, uh, Minister of Agriculture and Uganda Coffee Development Authority. In the countrywide demonstration expected to start next week, the farmers promised to carry their beddings to camp at all UDCA and Minister of Agriculture regional offices. And we are going to go to the Minister of Finance because, you know, they, they, are, they are prioritized to do other projects and yet they don't want to pay us our areas. Not that we hate the government, we love the government. We are also patriotic citizens. But please, we just want to be heard. Accordingly, they have threatened to clear gardens of all farmers whom they supplied seedlings on credit should the peaceful demonstration fail to yield. We are going to say, if they are not considered really, we shall also look at another alternative. We shall go and cut the coffee from the farmers and we shall see whether we shall have good votes in 2026 or not. A total of 1,645 nursery bed operators across the country are demanding for their arrears. Susan Naung and Andrew Sebira reporting for UBC TV. Medical experts have warned the general public against resisting the uptake of the yellow fever jab recently launched by government. Experts say yellow fever is a deadly disease which affects the liver of an unvaccinated person. We have more details. Government of Uganda recently launched a countrywide mass vaccination of yellow fever in Uganda. The exercise has commenced at various health facilities and schools across the country. Medical experts explain why a person should take the yellow fever vaccine. Yellow fever has no cure. Yellow fever has no specific drug. Uh, it affects the liver and we all know when the liver is dead, there's no way you can be okay. Because any drug to treat you, it is the liver that digests the drug. Yeah, so I urge everyone to be immunized. This, this drug is very safe very safe because me myself i was the first person to be immunized the campaign is fairly good though we haven't really reached 50 percent of the of the target population uh, for the first four days we have been targeting schools because we we have a target of uh, the age group between one year to 60 years among the categories exempted from taking the job are persons with chronic medical conditions Experts say uptake of this jab may exert pressure on the liver. You see basically this drug goes to the liver. Now the liver is overwhelmed. 
you're taking the drugs for hypertension, you're taking the drugs for, for the DM, and again, you're getting the shot. The liver is overburdened. It is once in 10 years, in 10 years. Yeah, but if you feel you want to come back, you can, get, you can come back for the booster dose. With HIV, we do stage them. Because having HIV does not mean that you are sick. But we are basically leaving those ones who are in stage 3, clinical stage 3 and 4. Why do we say clinical stage 3 and 4? Those ones have already developed the AIDS state. They are sick, chronically sick, and some are in the advanced stage. Uptake of the yellow fever vaccine is still low in some parts of the country, while others have adhered to this cause. Medics call for more sensitization to parents. We have been here for three days in Niboyogere CU Primary School, and we are so privileged that the turn up has been good. The parents of this school accepted their children to be vaccinated against yellow fever and there's been no resistance. In the schools at first it, uh, they were a, bit, a little bit resistant and hesitant because they, they, had, they had it in them that they had to consult from their parents. But we went on to educate the, our, um, the proprietors and the head teachers of schools uh, uh, that uh, it's not, it is not anywhere guided that we shall consult from the parents. At Wayogere Church of Uganda Primary School, the exercise was carried out in three days due to the large number of learners. Health workers say the only challenge got was with the dates of birth of the learners. The immunization was carried thoroughly well because I had very many children. In my school, I have 1,342 children. And we found ourselves that we have to give out three, three days carrying the, 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 the exercise. One day was not enough. Yellow fever is a viral infection spread to the people by the bite of an infected mosquito. Illness ranges from a fever with aches and pains to severe liver disease with bleeding and yellowing skin, which in the long run may lead to death. Mary Namkose, Mike Bakablindi, UBC News. Now to ensure proactive measures and public acceptance of vaccination exercises for specific diseases, it is essential to educate the public before implementing such initiatives. While there may not be a direct law enforcing health measures, it remains government's responsibility to prioritize the health of its citizens. Recently, the Minister of Health announced the mass vaccination campaign against yellow fever for individuals aged 1 to 60 years across the five regions. The vaccination campaign, which commenced on April 2, 2024, targets regions including Kampala, Ankole, Moroto, Soroti and Masaka. The voluntary mass vaccination, including in schools, aims to curb the spread of yellow fever and its potential health impacts. However, questions raise regarding the legal basis for enforcing such vaccination campaigns by the Minister of Health. General government has a duty to ensure that, uh, to do anything for the good order and well-being of its citizens. And uh, among those obligations is the, to ensure that they receive, those, uh, receive health care, which includes vaccinations. Uh, because the law says, the Immunization Act says that the, ministry, the minister can come up with a statutory instrument gazetting a particular disease for massive vaccination. In fact, it's mandatory and it makes it criminal for any parent who refuses to immunize a child who is within that child, uh, uh, that, that, that range of one year to six, six years. Well, as the yellow fever vaccination is voluntarily and requires parental consent for school children, some individuals remain hesitant, citing concerns over potential side effects of the vaccines. You're not supposed to administer medication or any form of medication by force, save for particular exceptions. So ordinarily you're not supposed to administer a vaccine by force or without the consent of the, of the person. So it's, even if the parents are not aware that they should give consent, it should be the duty of the vaccinators, because for them they are health professionals, to advise them that you are, we're supposed to require your consent before you're vaccinated. In the event of adverse reactions to administered vaccines, who bears the accountability? That not because of the vaccine itself, but maybe the vaccine was administered in a wrong manner or in a wrong dosage. That one you can hold the government or, uh, and its agent, the, the, the particular person, 
responsible. But if the wrong thing is as a result of something that was within the vaccine, that reacted maybe on particular individuals, then that one you can't blame the government because the government is administering. These drugs are approved by even World Health Organization, which is a UN body, uh, as fit for that purpose. So if it's something that goes wrong, uh, maybe you could sue the company uh, the, which manufactured the virus. Given public apprehension about the vaccines used, there is a call for NRC public education regarding the vaccines utilized in the campaign. However, not everyone shares this perspective. I don't think there is need uh, because ordinarily, just like all other drugs, when people go for painkillers, uh, when people go for pressure or high blood pressure drugs or diabetes drugs, they don't ordinarily are not given the ingredients of each and every drug. For some of these diseases which have been there for a long time, uh, polio, uh, uh, yellow fever, their vaccines have been tested over and over again. So the, on, the, the, the debate on the types shouldn't arise because by the time World Health Organization flags off a drug, it has gone through some bit of rigorous research. Loyajo Jamusi contains that public sensitization should precede any vaccination exercise. There are people who have biases against vaccines or against drugs generally. It's been a, a, a campaign of a few days, at least in the mainstream media, and we've not seen them enough showing reasons why this campaign and why at this time. That's why that sometimes when people come up with all sorts of bias against them, they even if it, they easily, they're, they're easily believed because of those boxes that they've not done enough to explain why are you doing this and why at this time. The yellow fever vaccination campaign started on 2nd April 2024 and is scheduled to conclude on 8th April 2024. Deborah Namamonde, Natongo Rebecca, UBC News. The Chambogo University Appointments Committee has given Dr. Aaron Lawrence a 14-day ultimatum to appear before the disciplinary committee and respond to the allegations of sexual harassment against him. Dr. Aaron is accused of sexually harassing a visually impaired senior four student while supervising a project tour. On the 31st of October 2023, Chambogo University Management constituted a committee to investigate allegations of sexual harassment against its senior lecturer and dean of the Faculty of Special Needs and Rehabilitation, Dr. Aaron Lawrence. The committee's report has established that Dr. Aaron Lawrence is the alleged perpetrator of sexual harassment against a visually impaired senior four student. But we all agree that this was a very unfortunate situation. It, it was not the university that raped the girl. It was the person. You see? So the punishment must be borne by the person. And we all agree that it was very unfortunate. Professor Katonguka says that visually impaired student was the beneficiary of the program, although we see his possibility, and had gone on a special tour to Nairobi. Dr. Aaron, as the supervisor allegedly, used the opportunity to commit the criminal offense. To assure, to, to assure them that, yes, this unfortunate situation happened, but it, it cannot be blamed on the entire university. It can be blamed on the person, and also how we handled it was according to our procedures and guidelines, which you cannot go, which you cannot go over. Since last year, Dr. Aaron has disappeared from the university, prompting management to serve him with a VVD proof to commence the next step of investigations. If he doesn't come, the rules, the special rules of procedure provide that in his absence, if he fails to come, then the decision can be taken expertly. In his absence, the body can proceed based on the evidence available, take a decision, either convicting him or acquitting him. However, the University Appointments Board has given him a 14-day ultimatum to appear before the University Disciplinary Committee. From today, we must serve him within a few, we must serve him and he must respond within 14 days. So within 14 days, even in the appointments board, they were asking us, because they want to expedite and handle this case, and conclude it. So within 14 days, we shall have gone through the entire process. And for me, that's what I'm seeing, because it has been over. It delayed because of the investigations. Mm -hmm. But after the investigations, everything is okay, because there are timelines within which we must actually comply and have a decision.
The university has affirmed to donors of various projects its commitment to providing a conducive environment for learners at the university. But we have told them we are going to improve our, the way we handle ethical standards and issues. And one of the things they told us is you expedite the, the, the development of your anti-sexual harassment policy. That policy is ready. It's going to top management and very soon will be approved so that whoever is involved in such acts, the, the, the law will take its course. The incident involving Dr. Aaron Rollins has not only affected the university's image, but also deterred potential donors for various projects and raised safety concerns within the special needs community. Abdul Nasili Luwama for UBC. UBC News Tonight takes a very short break, but we still have more stories. Don't move an inch. Fred! Osmosis. Freddy, Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO of Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky above the skies, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source Osmosis. of the Nile. I don't have money today. <laughs> Just a couple of loan of 200 k to stock my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The bank commander, not the bank tailor. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're so tingy. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. Have you packed, packed? more in Harbour Jelly and Harbour Irritations? No more rashes and irritations. Movit Habo Jelly and Habo Soap is rich in natural herbs for a smooth and glowing skin. Movit all day confidence. The government of Uganda and the Uganda Bureau of Statistics is calling upon all stakeholders such as the chief administrative officers, city mayors, resident city commissioners, city clerks, city and division councillors, wards and LC chairpersons as well as the residents and business communities to cooperate with the UBOS field teams as we embark on advanced preparations to conduct the national population and housing census on the 10th of May 2024. The census will be at 10-day exercise to obtain statistical data and information that will be used for planning and policy formulation including information on 1. How many we are, 2. Where we are, 3. How we are living, 4. What we own and 5. Where we access services from. The Uganda Bureau of Statistics has now started listing of households and mapping in the 11 cities of Arua, Fort Porto, Gulu, Hoima, Jinja, Lira, Mbale, Masaka, Mbarara, Soroti, and in the Greater Kampala, comprising of Kampala, Wakiso, and Mukono districts. For more information, please call 0755 342 128 or 0773 342 128. This message is brought to you by the Executive Director and Census Commissioner, Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Census 2024. It matters to be counted. Are you planning or in the process of traveling abroad for work? Using irregular channels to find and travel for work abroad often seems cheaper and faster, but you risk being trafficked, mistreated, or forced to do work you did not agree to. Using proper channels is safer, offers more protection, and better access to support services when problems arise. Do not be deceived. Choose the proper channels. Always verify all information before traveling abroad for work by contacting the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, your local district labor office or DSOS office. You can also visit EEMIS website on eemis.mglsd.go.ug. 
This message is brought to you by the International Labour Organization with support from the Government of Switzerland. Welcome back from that break and we're glad that you're still with us here in UBC News Tonight. Now in more news this evening, the Buganda Premier Charles Peter Maiga has pledged to support the move by the State Minister in charge of Youth and Children Affairs, Balam Barugahara, who has offered himself as a mediator for the release of political prisoners. Mayaga, who has received a section of Patriotic League of Uganda members at Pulange Mengo, notes that if it needs him engaging NUP leadership, he will do so for the good of the country. Ministers Dr. Balam Barugahara and Godfrey Kavianga under the Patriotic League of Uganda umbrella have paid a courtesy call to the Uganda Kingdom. At Bulange Mingo, the ministers, together with their supporters, have been received by the Uganda Premier, Charles Peter Maiga. General Mohosi, extend my congratulations to him for being named CEF. <laughs> you see, when you go to St. Mary's College, Suvi, <laughs> when you go to St. Mary's College, Suvi, good things follow you. So, uh, you came to Suvi many years after I left. But we are both smartists. So tell him that I say, as his elder brother, he must fill the office like a smartist. <laughs> the visit is part of the ongoing public response towards the Kabaka's marathon scheduled for this Sunday. <laughs> We thank you, Wichiti Wanyu, for the open door policy. You, you, you welcome everybody, irrespective of their political affiliation, religious affiliation, tribe, or any other category of people. Please maintain that open door. Policy. With the team purchasing kits worth 20 million shillings, the Uganda Kingdom Premier has appreciated this gesture. And, you know, the Kabaka is the champion of the fight against HIV AIDS, picked by UNAIDS, and we want to banish AIDS out of Uganda by 21st. The Uganda Premier, however, has added his voice to that of the Junior Minister for Youth and Children Affairs, Dr. Balam Barugahara, to facilitate the safe release of alleged political prisoners. I appreciate. Honorable Balam Barugahara for saying he's going to engage the president and any UP supporters who are in jail are released. Please engage with the leadership of the NUP and go to the president and these people get released. They were, they were arrested three years ago. We are into another election cycle. We need to unwind as Ugandans. And I think the gesture of releasing them we reconcile the country to a very large extent. And um, in your efforts to have them released, I'm your supporter. I'm your supporter. <clears throat> if you want to talk to the NUP leaders, I'll talk to them so that you work together. And everybody is out of jail. Maika is also recalling the need for a united Uganda. So let us all struggle for the unity of Ugandans. We have very slight differences, really. The two ministers were accompanied by PLA Central Committee members, that is Michael Mawanda, Michael Nwagira, alias Toyota, Daudi Kabanda, Cedric Babundirima, among others. Today as PLU, we have paid the courtesy visit to the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Buganda to hand in our contribution as PLU towards the Kawaka's call of keeping Ugandan's heresy. He has called various Ugandans to be heresy. Robert Onyango, UBC News. The District Education Officer, Madi Okolo, Aiba George Butele, emphasizes the urgent need to enhance the quality of education by addressing staffing shortages. He highlights the concerning teacher to learner ratio of 1 to 200, which significantly deviates from the standard ratio of 1 to 55. 
Madiokolo's district educational stakeholders are deeply perturbed and advocate for a transformation in the quality of teaching and learning. Excessive learners outnumbering teachers have caused significant challenges, particularly impacting learner retention, with girls being affected. The security, the safety of the girl child, the number of girls getting pregnant, teenage pregnancy. My own district, within one year, over 6,000 girls have gotten pregnant. Madiokolo district has the highest school dropout rate in the West Nile region. Out of every 1 million learners enrolled in primary one, only 150,000 managed to complete the primary cycle. There is uncertainty about the district's future given its poor performance in national exams such as PLOE, UCE and USCE. Take a primary school, but an enrollment of over 3,000 learners is only having 17 teachers who qualify to teach. So what miracle do you expect these teachers to do with the 500 learners in one class? Currently, there are 73 government-aided primary schools with a total enrollment of 73,362 learners, but only 670 registered teachers. The region enrolls the largest number of learners from refugee communities, potentially contributing to the overall academic challenges. The abnormal teacher people resource will be addressed. My appeal is to my government to, to ensure that an affirmative action consideration is made for Madokolo. Aiba George Butele, the district education officer, emphasizes the severity of the situation. As we're talking now, Madokolo only has 670 teachers in the post leaving us with a deficit of 707. So the teachers we need in Madokolo are more than the teachers in the post. Vasco Kura, an educationist affiliated with the Education Local Expertise Center Uganda, supports this claim, noting that out of every one million learners who start primary education in the West Nile region, only about 150,000 successfully complete primary seven. In West Nile sub-region, we had one of the lowest completion rates. Retention is not enough, but also completion, P1 to P7. The key thing that the local government needs to focus on is the performance on quality indicators. In response to these challenges, the Education Local Expertise Center Uganda and the International Rescue Committee have introduced a new approach, learning through play. This methodology enhances learning and learning experiences for both refugee and host communities. As a local who are able to train all the teachers, all the teachers in the seven primary school and three ECD centers. When the parents are engaged, the communities are engaged, we shall have a very strong ground to see that play matters uh, takes effect. Three early childhood development centers and seven primary schools in Reno refugee settlement have adopted the play matters methodology. That right now if we enter any class, it makes these learners today to enjoy teaching and learning process. The class is now changing because Eleko is helping us to bring materials for playing. For example, Play Matters brought for us Lego bricks. Ayana Francisco, UBC News. The former Chief of Defence Forces, General Wilson Mbadi, has assumed office as State Minister for Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, succeeding Harriet Ntabazi. During the handover ceremony held at the Farmer's House in Kampala, Mbadi wasted no time in outlining his vision and mission to transform Uganda's trade ministry into a powerhouse of economic growth, targeting youth employment and quality enhancement through the trade value chain. General Mbadi's ambitious plans include tackling youth unemployment head-on by creating vibrant trade opportunities and dissuading them from engaging in activities detrimental to societies such as strikes and vandalism. I understand the strategic importance of this ministry for the security of this country. 
because that's where I have been. Uh, and uh, so from that strategic point of view, uh, when I come to this ministry, it's because I know it plays a big, big role in the stability, peace, and security of this country. If you have money flowing into citizens' pockets through a good trade arrangements that allows proper or improved domestic trade and then not only quantitative but quality products for export, who will be out there to be convinced to go on the streets to go and demonstrate? Everybody's busy. Everybody's busy. I am looking after my cows and they say, let's go and demonstrate. Who is going to look after my cow? Yes. <laughs> he comes with his eyes set on revitalizing government's quest to attain a $500 billion GDP target by 2030. For us, we can only um, add on so that um, we, we go to the, what the president has been saying. He wants 500, a 500 billion U.S. dollars GDP. Is that what is? In the next 10 years. So incrementally, we must work towards that. And so the question has been, what policies? What legislation, what strategy, what plans, what linkage measures with the other MDAs are in place? You may think uh, uh, I've got some of the answers. And so those, as we, I settle, those are some of the things I will be looking at. Outgoing State Minister for Trade, Harriet Ntabazi, says she leaves the ministry having steered a campaign that saw the country's trade volumes increase. Uh, recently we took to Nigeria, we took to Mumbai, we are still opening other markets. And I was uh, in lead of that. And I want to pray that you just speak from where I have stopped. While welcoming him to his new appointment, the Trade Ministry expressed readiness to work with Mbadi in fostering the Trade Ministry's vision and working tirelessly to propel the nation's trade sector forward. And uh, we also gladly welcome the new minister. And we believe that he will be the driver, the ministry to, to drive the, the ministry to greater heights and pass and pick the baton from where Honorable Harriet Ntabazi has left off. Crispus, Ainitwe. Joel Vubia, UBC News. State Minister for Finance Amos Logolobi has commended Makere University's commitment to leveraging data for institutional advancement. Logolobi was officiating at the launch of the Mac Data System by Makere University aimed at enhancing internal processes within the university. In today's rapidly evolving digital landscape, the effective management and utilization of data have become paramount for organizations across all sectors. At the launch of the MAC data system at Makerere University, State Minister for Finance Amos Logolobe said the system will ensure compliance and facilitate decision making. Uh, right now, as you know, we are formulating the fourth national development plan. And we need data in various facets of life so that we are able to plan better. Makerere University Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of academic affairs, Professor Umal Kakumba, highlighted the milestones in their quest for enhanced data management. You know, these days with artificial intelligence, with the, all these things in the computer space, there's a lot of data. But how do you manage it? How do you now harness it to be able to make decisions? To make, impo uh, to make policies, to, 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 to have decisions that are based on facts, not just hearsay. So I think this, will go on, this is going to help us. 
organizations have relied on off-the-shelf systems, resulting in fragmented data and significant challenges in decision-making processes. So now to, to generate business intelligence that can guide decision-making, um, predictive analytics, uh, for us to be able to, to guide, of course, policy making at, at a much higher level than, than Makere, um, National Council of Higher Education, um, what needs to, changes that need to be taken in terms of the curriculum for, for the institutions to basically be um, a tandem with industry. Recognizing the critical importance of data-driven decision-making, Makere has embarked on a strategic transition towards in-house system development. We've had a challenge over the years. Makerere is part of the international linkages. We have partnerships spanning over uh, all of the continents in the world. We don't have any university outside any continent. We don't have any continent uh, where we don't have a partnership as a university. So Makerere is as broad as that. You talk about South America, you talk about Australia, you talk about Asia. The transition to in-house development facilitates the integration of information systems so that Kaye, UBC News. Fred! Osmosis. Freddy, Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO of Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky above the skies, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source What's of the Nile. I don't have money today. Just take a polite loan of 200 k to stock my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The bank commander, not the bank teller. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're so tingy. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. Attention everyone, the Ministry of Health has planned to vaccinate all persons aged 1 year to 60 years old to protect them against yellow fever disease. The mass vaccination will take place in 53 districts in these regions. Kampala, Buganda, Teso, Ankole and Karamoja. Vaccination is free and available at all government health facilities and outreach posts in these regions. The vaccination campaign will take place from April 2nd to April 8th, 2024. The vaccine is safe, effective and free of charge and has been approved by World Health Organization and Ministry of Health. This message is from Ministry of Health with support from Gavi. Welcome back from that break and now into the business scene. Airtel Uganda has today handed over a check totaling to 34.8 billion, which is 2% of the annual gross revenue for the year ending 2023 to the Uganda Communications Commission to support with the country's communication infrastructure development. While receiving Airtel's contribution, UCC Executive Director Honorable George William Nyombi Tembo highlighted that this contribution will undoubtedly go a long way in bridging the digital divide and fostering inclusive growth involvement across Uganda. The announcement was made during a press briefing held at the UCC head offices. Contribution is in accordance with the Communications Act and the terms of the network's license, which mandates telecom operators to allocate 2% of their annual gross revenue to support the development of rural communications infrastructure in the country. Because our role as technology enablers is to unlock the potential of Uganda 
as we connect people and businesses to opportunities. We are proud to be exceedingly delivering on this mandate. While receiving Airtel's contribution, UCC Executive Director George William Nyombi Tembo extended his heartfelt appreciation to Airtel for the contribution of 34.8 billion Uganda shillings. That we can unlock new opportunities and deliver greater value to our consumers. Furthermore, I reaffirm our unvarying commitment to facilitating the growth of telecom business in Uganda while prioritizing consumer protection. He further emphasized that this contribution will go a long way in bridging the digital divide and fostering inclusive growth involvement across Uganda. Under your able guidance, Airtel has consistently demonstrated a commitment to excellency, innovation, and corporate responsibility. Mr. Banerjee's strategic direction has propelled Airtel to new heights, making it a beacon of success. It has also put in place consumer engagement framework that espouses transparent consumer operator engagement that should be able to resolve most of consumer complaints. The managing director of Airtel Uganda, Manoj Morali, reaffirmed the network's commitment to providing reliable communication services in the country. He further remarked that UCC plays a vital role in fostering a thriving telecommunications sector that empowers Ugandans in an increasingly connected world. By fulfilling this obligation, Airtel Uganda demonstrates not just our compliance, a genuine commitment for national development. We are a responsible development partner actively participating in Uganda's digital transformation. Airtel Uganda donated Kabaka's birthday run kits to UCC members. Meanwhile, the director of Chisasi College School, Haj Latif, highlighted why the school engaged in such programs. Father continued to thank the Kabaka for the program and appreciated that this program has helped them to sensitize children on AIDS. Participate in Kabaka's birthday run. It's my humble appeal to all parents outside there, all schools to participate in this noble course because South Jakarta has been very instrumental in as far as fighting AIDS is concerned. So we must support him by buying uh, uh, these kids and also participating in this Kabaka's 69th birthday run on Sunday, inshallah. Therefore, as a church college school, we have bought uh, various uh, kits and indeed we are going to participate as, uh, as directors, as staff members and also students. The race will be held on Sunday 7th April 2024 with the aim of fighting against AIDS. Mary Namkose, Jamil Sekadja. The China National Offshore Oil Corporation has reassured on the government's commitment of producing the first fine oil by 2025. While providing the update on the progress of oil production in Kingfisher, the company confirmed that six out of 31 wells have been drilled. The Chinese embassy in Uganda has inspected the ongoing Sinok oil production in Kingfisher oil field, Chikube. The Kingfisher oil field is projected to contribute 40,000 barrels of crude oil, which is 30% of the anticipated Uganda's oil production. The investment eventually is going to be almost a third of the economy of, of Uganda, contributing about 30%. Uh, to the gross domestic product. Uh. Sinok Uganda reiterated their commitment on creating more jobs for Ugandans. So Canada con contractors already employ more than 3,500 local workers. As the construction continues, it is estimated that approximately 170,000 new jobs will be in Uganda. With efforts towards the local content adherence, Sinok is working closely with partners to protect the environment and other related corporate social responsibilities. Sinok has been actively fulfilling its cooperative, uh, corporate social res responsibility while promoting the construction of projects. It has continuously increased its investment and support for local education, medical care, employment, and environmental protection, and helped local economic and social development. As part of community engagement program, Sinok co-hosted 17 regional schools around Kingfisher Oilfield, where 30 students competed 
in a drawing competition. Your creativity and innovation are the keys to unlock not just the prizes, but the opportunity for a better future. Sincerely hope through this event, you can enhance understanding of China and the Chinese enterprises and become a voice of China-Uganda friendship in the near future. This initiative targets to promote talented students to further their opportunities. The awarding function was marked under the theme, The Beauties of Kingfisher in Your Eyes. And the uh, win has come this far. So. Lydia Chomkama and Juma Samba, UBC News. Fred! Osmosis. Freddy, Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO of Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky above the skies, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source of Osmosis. the Nile. I don't have money today. Mm -hmm. Just a copyright loan of 200, you get to stock on my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The bank commander, not the bank tailor. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're so tingy. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. Welcome back from that break and now into the sports scene. Hundreds of spectators had gathered at St. Peter's Church grounds in Butebo district to witness the climax of the Museveni Helen Seku Cup, which had been facilitated by Helen Seku, the Commissioner General of Patriotism. Now in the final match, Butebo Town Council emerged victorious over Petete Town Council, while the Petete Ruru soccer team secured third place. Present to witness the final games were the Minister of Youth and Children Affairs, Balam Bargara, and the host, Helen Seku. <laughs> On behalf of the organizing committee and the sponsors of this event, and on behalf of the owner of the tournament, General Museveni Kabuta, the president of Uganda, allow me to hand over this trophy to you as winners of this year's tournament. Christmas Day, we shall be back with a bigger tournament for everyone to enjoy. Allow me also to request my sister, Commissioner Helen Saku, Honorable Council, the lawyer of the president. <laughs> Well, that wraps it up. Our first edition of UBC News tonight. Do join us for our second edition at 10 o'clock. I'm Lorraine Masika Kazimoto. See you at 10. UBC, inspiring Uganda. Qualified, professional, and compassionate doctors talking real solutions to real health problems. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from partners.
good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to doc talk to the doc talk show today on doc talk we are at lira regional referral hospital where we will be discussing kidney disease in uganda and some advanced treatment options for it my name is daniel chigundu um, a kidney specialist specialist in internal medicine and nephrology and i practice at chirudu national referral hospital i'm also a member of the Uganda Kidney Foundation, and I am privileged to host the show today. I'm joined by two gentlemen who I'm going to request to introduce themselves. Good evening, viewers. My name is Manuel Okleng. I work at Kirudu National Referral Hospital. I work at the dialysis in charge. I'm also a medical tutor by training. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chigundu and Mr. Chileng. My name is Daniel Olila. I'm a medical officer here at Lira Regional Referral Hospital and I'm also a member of the hemodialysis team or the dialysis unit in the hospital. Thank you. To begin the show, we would like to frame the burden of kidney disease and I will ask uh, Mr. Okileng, how common is kidney disease? Thank you very much, Dr. Dan. Uh, Chronic kidney disease, which is a progressive condition, affects slightly more than 10% of the global population. It's said that about between 800 and 850 million uh, people are affected by kidney disease worldwide. To give a context, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's said that about uh, 10% of the general population suffering from kidney disease. And here in Uganda, the burden of disease ranges between 7 and 10%. To put it much more clearer, it's say that about 3.1 million people die annually as a result of kidney disease. That makes it the eighth most leading cause of death, especially among the, death, the adult population. It said that by the year 2040, it will be the fifth leading cause of mortality worldwide. Our work involves seeing a lot of patients with kidney disease on a daily basis. And that can make it feel like it is everywhere. But um, we know that it's recognized as a growing cause of, of disease here in Uganda and globally. The current belief is that People in low and middle income countries are the most affected by chronic kidney disease. Um, I wonder how you see it, um, whether you think that this is a truly re reflection of the general practice. Uh, uh, it said that <clears throat> in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 10% of the general population suffer from kidney disease. And in Uganda, between 7 to 10 percent of the population suffering from kidney disease, with variations depending on which region you're talking about, the highest being around 13 percent in eastern Uganda. In terms of mortality, I'd say that about 3.1 million people globally die annually from kidney disease, making it the eighth leading cause of death uh, globally. And it's forecast that by 2040, it will perhaps be the fifth leading cause of death globally. And we're already in 2024, so we're not far away from 2020, 2040, unless something is done about this. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, at the National Referral Hospital, we receive patients with kidney disease from all over the country. And we know that the things that set people up to get kidney disease are multiple. Um, although I always feel that we have a skewed perspective because we gather everybody from everywhere. But I'd like to um, find out if uh, what we see at Lira Referral Hospital where my colleague Dan Olila works is similar to what we see. We see lots of patients affected by high blood pressure and diabetes. We also see mothers with, with, with uh, with complications of delivery, and I wonder how much of this you see, you are seeing at the regional sites. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Chigundu, and thank you once again, our viewers. In uh, Lila Regional Referral Hospital, 
and maybe in Lango as a whole. Yes, like Dr. Dana said, we've had a number of patients presenting with the kidney disease. We've taken data from the medical wards, we've taken data from pediatric ward, we've taken data from um, maternity, maternity wards. So we realize that in the medical wards, most of the patients who end up having um, renal disease or chronic kidney disease are patients who are having um, risk factors like hypertension and diabetes. So most of these patients, when you assess them, you realize they are having what? They are having kidney disease. And uh, when we go to the surgical wards, our patients mostly are patients who have had sepsis. They are operated, then they develop sepsis, then the sepsis eventually progresses into either acute kidney disease, acute kidney injury, or eventually to chronic kidney disease. And um, across to maternity ward, we've realized that most of the patients we are having, and really there have been quite a number of them, um, patients who have had, um, who are in their postpartum period. Yes, these are patients probably who develop um, sepsis after the, in, the, after in the postpartum period. And then eventually they also progress into either acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. And we've also had quite a number of patients, be it, be it acute, acute kidney injury, resulting from uh, eclampsia. We've had quite a number of them, and we've dialyzed them, and uh, we've had very good outcome. And uh, in the pediatric section, we've, majority of the cases of children we've had, uh, we've had having kidney disease are because of um, severe malaria. Yes, it's because of severe malaria. Most of the children we've had present with the background history of severe, having suffered from severe malaria. Thank you. So bleeding after delivery, pregnancy-related complications of, of, of high blood pressure com complicating pregnancy and severe malaria are some of the causes that we see much more in the community uh, that predispose people to kidney diseases. And many times when the worst comes to the worst, they need the advanced kidney disease that uh, advanced kidney disease treatments that, uh, especially what is called dialysis. Um, Emmanuel, would you care to break down hemodialysis for us? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dan. Uh, dialysis is a medical procedure that is done to remove waste products and excess fluids from blood when the patient's kidneys are no longer working properly. It's usually done by, by passing a patient's blood to a machine called the dialysis machine. Thank you, Emmanuel. And for the longest time, uh, dialysis in Uganda has been confined to the big urban centers, mainly Kampala and Barara. This treatment has been in Uganda since the mid 2000s, so about 2005, because hemodialysis in the world became prominent in the 1960s. So it took us all that long for hemodialysis to come from the world to Uganda. And what we have here at Lira Regional Referral Hospital is a unique partnership, because although I work at Chirudu National Referral Hospital, I have become a frequent visitor here at Lira Regional Referral Hospital where we have set up a satellite arrangement. So two years ago in this space, we didn't have kidney dialysis treatments. And we were bursting at the seams at the center with patients filling up our site and we were badly in need of expansion. However, when we paid attention to our, our our data, what we saw was that most of our patients came from around the, around the city, within 150 kilometers from Kampala. What that meant is that although we were serving very high numbers of patients, we were not represent, representatively distributed around the country. It also meant that the people who lived the farthest 
were the most disadvantaged in accessing this therapy. And so we dared to imagine a situation where we'd bring the treatment closer to the people, and that involved a lot of uh, collaboration. Mr. Uh, Okileng has been at the heart of uh, preparing the site, some of the practical work that we have done, and he can break it down for us to tell us the steps that we required to, to, to come to this point. Thank you very much, Dr. Dan. The idea to extend dialysis, dialysis services to satellite sites of Lira, uh, Mbale, and uh, Mbarawa were born out of the realization that uh, at the center we are having an overwhelming number of patients and um, there was a need to expand. So um, we had to make a decision whether to expand within the hospital or to be equitable and distribute services to other regions of the country. Uh, so this idea was hatched and with uh, God's grace uh, it was supported by the Minister of Health and here we are having dialysis sites in Mbale, Lira and Mbara. So even if we made it look like a short jump, there was really a lot of background work that went into making this transfer. And when we come back, we will give you a glimpse on, into what it took to be able to come uh, and, and offer this service here. And we will show you what the lives of some of the patients we have impacted uh, look like now. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from partners. You are watching the Doc Talk Show. Fred! Osmosis. Freddy, Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO of Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky above the skies, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source Osmosis. of the Nile. I don't have money today. <laughs> Just take a polite loan of 200 k to stock on my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The bank commander, not the bank tailor. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're so tingy. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. One on one with Michael Jordan Lukomwa. A weekly face to face conversation focusing on accountability, inspiration, information, and sensitization of the public from the various sources, such as inspirational profiles. Having a disability is not inability. Professional guidance. There is no special antiretroviral uh, therapy that, that is given specifically for, for Discord and what? A couple. And of course, politics. Don't you see anywhere that you would give a credit in the fight against COVID? My role as the owner of the country is not to, you know, be preoccupied by giving credit to my server. We have said that if we are to talk to uh, Genome 70, there must be certain conditions in place. Is it true that you paid 5 million shillings to MPs that voted for Anita Mong and Tayebo? That is laughable. Why would we pay when we have nominated them as SEC? Every party has been represented in Uganda's parliament for 10 years. We only By one MP. You yourself. And my daughter. <laughs> Every Friday, 9 p.m., it's one on one with Michael Jordan Lukomwa on UBC TV, inspiring Uganda. You are watching the Doc Talk Show. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from partners. My name is Alfred Okot. I'm from Kidgum district. My problem started with the pressure. After pressure, it comes to diabetes. Then, after diabetes, kidney failure. I was referred from Kidgum Government Hospital to Nsambia Hospital. And from Nsambia, it was really 
not good on my side because of the price. So at our place, it is nearer. My name is Abua Esther. Um, this sickness started when I was in Lira here. I stayed, okay, I went to Gulu for, to, go, to get the treatment, but we tried and things was not still okay. Doctors from there, they referred me to um, Chirudo National Referral Hospital. So I went there. I started uh, dialysis in March 2019. And since then, I stayed there uh, from 2019 up to 2023, uh, February. Then in that February, I came back when this dialysis came in Lira, I heard that this dialysis now is in Lira. I came back, the treatment is going on well. And from Chirudo there, I was getting also a, a very good treatment. Mm, uh, like in Chirudo, they were giving us like uh, dialyzers, heparin, medicine, uh, medicine such as uh, retrofoitin, they were giving us, and also medicine for pressure. We were getting it. And I thank God we came here we are also getting the same things which we were getting from there. Uh, medicine such as retropoetin and iron sucrose, we are still getting it. And also medicine for pressure, we are still getting it. The good care also, this hospital is still giving us. I thank God for that. And I thank God I am now home and I'm getting the treatment from home. As you have seen, our work here is impacting, starting to impact real patients at Lira Regional Referral Hospital. And you will notice that some of them initially simply had a homecoming process to leave the places that they were receiving treatment from in Kampala to come and start living with their families within their communities and to reduce the disruptions to their lives. You can also witness that the treatments are being initiated and maintained here at the hospital itself and the people offering this wonderful service are none other than the team of which my colleague here, uh, Daniel Olila, is part. Daniel, tell us what has the journey been like since we left you here to, 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 to run with it. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Chigundo. The, 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 the dissemination of um, the dialysis machines and then the eventual strategy of the hemodialysis sessions has been really a revolutionary, revolutionary achievement in, in, in Lira, in Lango, and then in the, the entire North, Northern region. Mm, we've had quite a number of, of achievements over the past one year or so that the immunization started in, the, in this part of the country. Mm, to break it down in terms of numbers, over the past one year, we've had about um, close to 1,300 immunization sessions that were done for our patients. And um, I recall our first case, the first session that we did was about on the, 
on the 6th day of January, that was 2023, and it was really an important day in the, 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 the history of the hospital as a whole. We remember that day the patient said, we are, we are, I am going to remain here. I want to be the first patient to be dialyzed in the hospital. And it was really a nice experience for both the staff and the patient. So we've had uh, quite a number of achievements. And then, um, like Dr. had said, we, we brought services very close to our patients. We've reduced on the burden of transport, the cost of the accommodation in the city. So patients have really appreciated the, the, the service that we got closer to them. And um, currently, as I talk, we have about 36 active patients whom we are dialyzing in our dialysis unit in the hospital. And if we are forever, we shall forever be grateful to the team, the Chirudu team, and then to the Ministry of Health and then the partners for bringing this service closer to the people of, North, of the Northern region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Olila. Um, I'm very pleased to hear the things that you are saying as a, a, a kidney doctor. Um, just to mention one thing, the hemodialysis service being offered here is subsidized, heavily subsidized by the government of Uganda, by the taxes that our taxpayers pay. Um, and that allows us to deliver the service at a fraction of the market prices, less than 20% of the cost around. So as you can tell, this took a lot of, um, as you might guess, this, this took a lot of negotiation and uh, behind the scenes work. And Emmanuel might be able to give you highlights on how we did the entire transfer of service, not simply a transfer of machines, but trying to replicate the entire service, the way it happens in the center to happen at the regional hospital. So Emmanuel is going to expound on the process the, how, that we undertook to transfer the service. Um, but just before he does that, we'll take a short break. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from partners. You are watching the Doc Talk Show. Coming soon on UBC. The Uganda People's Defense Forces, UPDF, has undergone a transformation from a small guerrilla force into a large professional national army, National Resistance Army, which later became Uganda People's Defense Forces, has managed to grow from strength to strength because it was founded on the right ideology that emphasized discipline, patriotism, pan-Africanism, and socioeconomic transformation agenda. Don't miss the UPDF Legacy program on UBC TV that has a central focus on infrastructure development, social, as well as preserving and defending the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Uganda. The program will showcase commitment by the Uganda People's Defense Forces in its pursuit of sustainable peace and security in the country. Coming soon, only on UBC TV. UBC is the national public broadcaster. We educate, inform, entertain, and inspire our audiences. You can watch us on free-to-air channel 001, DSTV channel 282, Go TV channel 371, Star Times channel 201, Zuku TV channel 20, and Azam TV channel 350. Even when your subscription expires, you can still watch UBC for free on your pay TV platforms. You are watching the Doc Talk Show. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from partners. <laughs> 